So we're, talk, we're going to talk about inner laminar epidurals, which is where we put the needle through or between the lamina, hence interlaminar, between the two lamina. And the lamina are the back part of the, of the spinous uh, portions here, the, the posterior elements we call them. And on either side of the spinous process, we have a lamina. It's that flat part. And the concept is to come down and touch the lamina and then walk into this ligament that separates the, the two called the ligamentum flavor. So we come over here, and the idea is that we have the best angle. And again, we're trying to approximate the, the skin. Okay, That gives us the flattest angle. So Evelyn, just looking at this picture, you know, we're trying to get great uh, in-plate uh, uh, approximation, and we want sharp or crisp in-plates. So looking at this image, can you show me a crisp in-plate? I would show you this one. Yeah, that's very crisp. That's I totally agree. Crisp. Any others? Bottom here. Yep, that's very crisp. And what about the end plate here? Let's call this L5, the top end plate of L5. Crisp or not crisp? Not crisp. Correct. Not crisp. You're exactly right. So looking at this picture and, and uh, criticizing it, you know, I would look at this and I would say, this is probably not the angle that's best for this uh, epidural. Had, had the doctor been wanting to go here at, uh, say, 3-4, now that's nice and crisp, and we can see the inner laminar space quite nicely. But that inner laminar space really is between the spot, the bottom of one spinous process and the top of the other. But the doctor will likely start over the bone here, walk down to the bone, and then that will let her know the depth. And then the doctor will walk into this inner laminar space and then through the ligamentum flavor. So the, the concept is you want to be AP, and you want to, you want to have the disc as crisp as possible because the disc is this thing you can't see that's separating these two vertebral bodies because you can't see disc on an x-ray. Make sense? Makes sense. Yeah, good job. Okay. You had had a question about the spinal cord. So when you do an a, um, lateral uh, epidural, how close are you to the actual spinal cord and are you going lateral to it? Well, in inner laminar, not necessarily. So a good question was asked on with the inner laminar epidural, you know, what's going on. And so the idea is you place the needle down to the, the posterior uh, lamina here, you walk. The next thing you go through is called the ligamentum flavum. That's a ligament that goes between the lamina. And then once you're through the ligamentum flavum, you're in the epidural space. What that means, epidural, means outside epidura, which is means tough in, in Greek. And so you are between the uh, the outside of the fecal sac or dura, and, but inside the spine. And so I always make the, the, the analogy, it's kind of like if you took a two liter bottle and you put a balloon inside the two liter bottle, and you blew up the balloon inside that two liter bottle and then you tied it off. So now the, you can't go beyond the size. You can't make that balloon bigger than the two liter bottle because it's confined by the two liter bottle, but you can make it just the same. So you blow it in there and you tie it off. When we're doing an epidural, in inner laminar, we're putting the needle through the plastic of the two liter bottle, but not so deep as to pop the balloon. If we go too deep and we're inside the balloon, then we're inside the intrathecal space. And the totally different things occur when you inject steroid or inject medicine intrathecally. It's a totally different response. Sometimes you can put the steroid inside the intrathecal space, you can get clumping of the nerve roots, arachnoiditis. You hear about these, that's why we use no preservative in any of our uh, epidural steroids that we use, or no preservative in any of the medicines that we can put even near the spine. Because those preservatives can cause uh, uh, scarring inside the spine. So we never do we use any type of uh, preservative. When we're going close, we could put it intrathecally. Um, the other thing is sometimes we want to go intrathecal. Like, I mean, it's kind of like an inner laminar epidural, but just one layer deeper. And the way you know that you're intrathecal and not epidural is because when you inject that contrast, it's a totally different pattern. The contrast epidural is spread out quickly because it's a plane between two uh, um, uh, surfaces. But in, when you're inside the bag, it just either blobs or it actually forms around the nerve roots. You see a, a strain or it looks like a hair, okay, and that's the actual nerve roots. So the question is, how close are you to the spinal cord? So let's say you're in the neck, we know the spinal cord goes all the way from the, the top of the, or the base of the skull all, all the way down here, and it stops at 
L1, L2, and most people sometimes D12. So if you're in the thoracic spine doing an interlaminar, you're over the cord. You go too far, you're going to go into the spinal cord. Same thing in the neck. You go too far, you're putting that big needle right through the spinal cord and that's it. Lumbar, we talked about why do we always do a, uh, an LP in the lumbar spine, is because if we go to, we're going to go too far. That's the idea. We're going to go too far. We want that fluid. We know that these nerve roots are there, and these nerve roots are like, you know, sticking your finger through hair versus sticking your finger through the head. The hair will part, the head will not. Okay? And so that's what you're banking on, is that these nerve roots will move out of the way as you put the needle in again. Keep the patient awake. They say, ah, oh, it's going down my leg. It's not. Respect what the patient's telling me. That was a great question. So you're close. If you look on the MRI, and we always do, we, we see the cord, then we see that CSF collar around the cord. On the outside of the CSF will be the dura. We don't really see the epidural space because it's really like trying to see the, the space between the balloon and the two liter bottle. We're talking about facet joint nerve blocks. The whole purpose of a facet joint nerve block is to numb the nerve. What does the nerve go to? A facet. Correct. The facet is the joint. It's also called the, called the zygopophyseal joint. And the idea is that it's a diagnostic, occasionally therapeutic way of numbing the joint up. The reason we do it is because we want to know if the joint is the cause of pain. If we numb the joint, the pain goes away, the joint was the issue. Or whatever was in the distribution of the nerve was the issue. So the nerve goes to the joint and a couple other structures, but mostly the joint. So the way we do a lumbar facet joint nerve block is, again, you know, the way I do it is a little different than most people. Most people, if you're going to do, say, four nerves, you're going to use four needles or three nerves, three needles. I use one needle for everything. I simply direct it to the spots we're going to go through one skin poke, which is a little different than what most people do. But the idea is, you, if we know where the target is, then you know how to set up the procedure. So what I do is I start at uh, the transverse process of L5, uh, then I go to L3, maybe also L2, and then also down to S1. Whatever you're going to do, whatever the doctor's going to do, hopefully you're going to do the same thing every time so that they can predict it and the fluoroscopist doesn't have to be searching and, and once they know the pattern in the dark, and you know, it's not on, coming on you to know that, it's coming on the doctor to tell you. So don't, don't feel like a klutz, it's the doctor's responsibility. But the idea is this, the nerve sits in the groove, okay, right here, and you can see we've marked it in over the years, this little, uh, this little line there. And it is a nerve that runs, comes, connects off of the, the main nerve, wraps back here, and then it goes right up here to this portion of the articular surface, and then at the other half of it goes down to the inferior portion, okay? Right here, where it's going to go to the next joint. So one nerve goes to one half of two joints. Each joint has two nerves that go to it. So like from this joint, it's going to be a nerve coming from here and a nerve coming from here. But if we go here, we get the nerve before it splits. So the idea is to put the needle right here, 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 all the way up and down. If we put the needle there, nerve, we know with a high likelihood that the nerve will also be there because we've done enough cadaveric dissection on enough people to see this commonly in the same spot. And then that's where we want to inject a little numbing medicine right here. So the idea is to give a good view of the transverse process, however the doctor wants. Usually it's AP. Uh, if you give an oblique, they can see it as well, uh, like the Scotty dog. But again, the lineup is to, again, approximate with the, the angle of the spine sweeping, you know, cephalocaudad for the high lumbar, probably caudocephalad for the lower lumbar, and at L4 it's usually what? AP. AP. That's exactly right for most people. So, but that's the idea for a set joint nerve block. Same idea with an ablation, because an ablation is the exact same placement of the needle. With the ablation, what we really want to do is we want to take the actual long, the, the last tip. You know when you look at the needle, there's that shielded part, and then there's the tip that's not. We want to place the tip along the actual path of the nerve. So if we come, say, top down and have only the tip, the lesion isn't caused at the tip of the, of the needle. We, the lesion is caused along the actual uh, path of the nerve. It's a spindle-shaped lesion. So the doctor really should, and this is probably the biggest uh, error that most doctors make, is they don't place the needle along the actual path of the nerve. The nerve is lying flat on this bone. That means the needle should be coming from uh, down to up like this. It should not be top down. So if you see a guy going top down on here, you, you'll know in your mind it's probably not the best projection. 
uh, not the best results. You want to get as flat as possible. And it's why really when we're in L2, do we see the biggest twitch? We see the biggest twitch at L2 when we do that sensory testing because we're usually wanting as flat as humanly possible um, to that nerve. And you'll see it there. Um, but that's a facetra nerve block inhalation on the lumbar spine. Again, you moving the C-arm, you know, uh, caudo, uh, cephalad when you're in the low, cephalocaudad when you're in the high lumbar spine. Oh, for Richard did figure for me. Yes. yes. <laughs> Because I always thought that you, you do the percent nerve block inhalation yep. that you're hitting these nerves, so it's always the nerve that's on top. That is an excellent question. Oh, okay. And that's that's such an important thing to, to recognize for a lot of reasons. Number one is if we are if the needle is say too far close down to the what we call the spinal nerve, okay, mm -hmm. this nerve joins the plexus and it forms the sciatic nerve and goes down the leg or the femoral nerve. If you ablate this sucker, you will paralyze the patient, oh, okay. okay, or really injure them in a big way, and it's generally not reversible. So, all the more importance to make sure that when you and we'll take a, a lateral off, and we want to make sure that the needle is not anterior down here next to the disc where the or the pedicle where the, the nerve is coming out. If the patient is asleep, sedated during an ablation. And you're doing, you don't have the patient awake to tell you, yeah, I feel that in my leg. Or when we do the motor testing, I feel it in my leg. That's a great question. I'm glad you were asked. The other reason is, so we, do a, we can do a sensory and a motor test. You know, I don't do the sensory as much because radiographically we know we're in the right place. But what really matters most is always safety. So we do the motor every time. And what we're doing is we're, imagine the tip of this is the unshielded portion of the needle. If the needle is in the correct location, posterior, you're just sitting right there in the groove of this bone. It is not close enough to this nerve, which goes to the leg. So when we turn up the motor stem, we'll get twitch of the little muscle here in the back that comes from this nerve, the, the medial branch, we call it, but not the main nerve. If we're too close to the main nerve, it will also cause a twitch down here, and you'll get a twitch in the leg. Conversely, same thing in the neck. If you're too close to the nerve coming out because of your arm, you get a twitch in the arm. No twitch in the leg means you're safe as long as the machine's operating perfectly and properly. So, in the idea between between the motor and the um, and uh, why it's safe is, I tell patients or people if if you want to tell a secret safely and you know you're the right proximity, if you yell and no one else can hear you, they'll never be able to hear you when you whisper. So the motor is a big, large area. We're broadcasting three to four times the size of the lesion. Okay, so we know that we're safe. It's like the safety circle when you're working with a knife. You know, you know if you're out here, you guys can't get cut. One of them would on wood. You're outside the zone. And if we do the motor testing and we don't get the twitch from this nerve, we know that we're going to be inside the zone when we do the ablation. So that's why we do the motor twitch. You're exactly right. This is not what we want. This is what we want. And that's also important in terms of coagulation. So when a patient comes in there on Plavix, and they say, I don't know if I can have that procedure, if you are going inside the spine where there's uh, blood vessels, no procedure, because they might bleed and cause a, a big compression. If you're in the soft tissue, away from these nerves where there could be compression, you can, they might have a little bleeding but it will not be of much consequence because they'll just bleed and they'll eventually stop, but it won't cause nerve compression. That's the difference between the epidurals and the facets with, with bleeding. If we go down deep, put a needle inside the spine, and you nick a little uh, blood vessel, they'll bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and ultimately get into the spine and compress the spinal cord of the nerve roots. So, let's talk about the sacral stuff. The sacrum <laughs> is just the base of bone right at the bottom of the lumbar spine. Occasionally we will want to do an epidural in the sacrum or uh, for a sacral transferamal. These are the foramen. You can see these holes. You know, there's there's probably five of them, uh, at least four, often five, and occasionally six. Okay, and each one, the S1 nerve comes out of the S1 foramen. The S2 nerve out of the S2 foramen. S3 nerve out of here. And if you look at the spine, okay, you can see. Here's the patient just standing up. Here we are. If we are AP, we're not going to see through the S1, right? We probably won't even see through the S2, but we will see through the S3. So what do we have to do? We have to go caudocephalad to see S2, 
we have to go even more cephalad to CS1. And if you see the patient standing like this, here's the beam angle, okay, which means you've got to really be very cephalad because we're projecting up through here to see that hole. Right? It's hard to see through there. But you've got to have a big angle. If you're top down, you won't make it. So the segment's pretty easy. You're always AP, okay, just like that, but you have a lot of cephalad angle. You have a question, Evan? The more low you get, let's say you're doing S3, you'll be a little less cephalo. You may even be AP. S4, you may even be cephalo caudal. Okay? Now, there's one type of epidural we do called a caudal. And sometimes if we're going to do adhesial lysis, we'll also come through the caudal canal. Sometimes you may put spinal cord stimulator leads through the caudal uh, canal. You can't see it on this, but this thing is called sacral hiatus. We just saw this yesterday we were doing a caudal. And there's something called a sacral uh, cornu. Okay, and the cornea just means a horn, okay? Here on either side, you can feel it in a thin patient. You can feel this, and right in between those cornea will be the sacral hiatus. And what do we see here? It's just basically um, ligamentum flavor, for lack of a better term. You put the needle in here, and you pass through. So the easiest way for you guys to help the doc is, you're not gonna need, uh, an AP is hard to see this. The best projection is you will see the difference, okay, in a lateral between just the coccyx in here, and then it gets much thicker here. So if you see that difference on lateral, you know that the needle is going to come in right here, and you can come right through there. So I always start the, uh, the caudals in the lateral position, uh, cross table lateral. So then I'm looking here, and not to give away all my secrets because it took years to figure this out, but you can project the needle uh, perfectly if you feel the anatomy hinting to any doctor watching it. So if you feel the anatomy of the lumbar spine, that'll tell you your exact angle. You don't ever need to go to an AP. Okay. You just go in the lateral, and then once you've got the needle in and the catheter in, you can go back to the AP projection to follow the catheter up. Any questions? Right. So in the thoracic spine, we're going to do, if you're looking at the thoracic, look at the lumbar first because we're going to go faster in the thoracic than we did in the lumbar just because a lot of the concepts are the same. We're going to talk about facetal nerve ablations, blocks, uh, transfer epidural steroid injection, costal nerve blocks, and an inner laminar Those are the most common things we do. So in the thoracic spine, there's a little difference. The difference is, if you look at the transverse process, it's all very variable. Out here, you can see it's kind of the same in the lumbar spine, okay? But there's all kinds of different shapes to the, uh, the transverse process in the thoracic spine. The other difference that we know in the thoracic spine is that the central nerve, okay, medial branch of the dorsal primary ramus, the nerve raptor is variable. The, the guy who did all these dissections, they're a lot, they're very similar between individuals in the lumbar, very similar in the neck and the cervical spine between individuals, but in the thoracic spine, you know, uh, Evelyn and Dominic, there may be totally different spots, you know, and that's a problem for us because we don't have that uh, uh, type of reproducibility, reproducibility based on the anatomy. You may have one nerve that sits here on one person and one that sits out here on this person. And so we actually use a little larger inject date. I actually come across the midline when I do it. But the concept is the same. Generally what we want to do, position the patient accordingly. Again, you want to keep the, uh, the image intensifier parallel to the skin. If you're in the high thoracic, you're going to have a little more caudocephalad. Low thoracic, maybe a little more cephalocaudad. And you're going to basically count. And that's really important. The hardest thing to know is like, where are you? Because the, the, the image is so small that you can only see a patch of the thoracic spine. You don't know if this is the T3 or the T7. Okay. So you, again, have to start by showing the doctor, either the lumbar or the cervical levels. Maybe even best to count down in the thoracic since there's more variability. But you're showing the base of the cervical spine, and then you can count the ribs as you count down. So let's say you can do T7, you count down to the seventh rib, or even uh, you'll see the rib come right under here. There are no ribs on this, obviously. But the idea is to, again, project where you're going to go. And often what I'll do with these, I'll do a separate skin boat for each one. Okay, because then I know I'm coming down here. And I'll come right to the posterior portion of the transverse process. I may even march across the transverse process and numb a little bit across. It'll kind of like I'll leave a little line of numbing medicine across there. When I do the ablation, I want the needle to go across it as much as possible. So that I get at the flat part of that needle against or across the nerve so I get a good ablation. With the, um, the transfer animals, in the thoracic spine, we are worried about, anyone remember? The 
artery of the artery of a dam coitus. That is exactly right. Ten extra points. <laughs> the artery of a dam coitus, and it's much more prominent on the right or the left. 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 The left. Not always. It can be anywhere. But we know. Remember when we were talking about the foramina? In the foramen, what comes in this in and out the superior portion that you don't really see in the inferior portion? Do you remember anything along those lines? The nerves and vessels come in the superior. So when you look at the foramen from the side, you can see in the superior portion, the high part, this is where the nerve is going to be. It's going to be where the nerve, artery, and vein most likely are. We look at a bunch of projections. Very rarely do we have anything going in or out of the base or the bottom of the foramen. So if you're going to do an epidural in the thoracic spine, we almost always do this discal view, okay, where the disc is on plane, like a retro discal epidural. So what you do is you, it's really important to have the disc crisp, okay? Then you come up with just a tiny oblique because what we're going to do is we're going to walk the needle down here and then we're just going to go uh, right up next to the base and maybe even wrap it into and in, uh, in front of the superior articular process here so that we're against the base of the disc. Where it gets the base of the disc, it can be really hard to get the artery. And that's the way I do an inner lamer, or a yeah, transforamal. The inner lamer is again the same idea. You want to get as much space, okay? And this may be different because the space between the lamina may not correlate with the disc here. Because you can see the disc is at one angle, the lamina is at a different angle. So with this one, you're going to have probably more, if you're in the low, you're going to have more cephalocaudad, okay? Even in the mid, even more cephalocaudad. Because look, now looking through, the only way to get the needle underneath there, tight, right? It's tight. You've got to walk from this angle. You can't come top down. It's guarded and protected, okay? And it's even same here in, in the uh, high thoracic. You're going to want a more cephalocaudid angle so you can see underneath and see that little hole. But that, that's the hole. That's where you want to put the needle. So you're going to, again, just the, like you, your eyes are viewing at this angle, you don't want to be the serum viewing it at this angle. Okay, so cephalocaudid. Does that make, make sense? If you can go to the cervical spine, there's usually a pretty good space here around C7, T1, or T1, T2, or even T2, T3, where you can get the needle in. That's the inner lamina. Same concept that was the lumbar. With the uh, intercostal nerve block, the idea is that you start here, and then you're going to simply, you got to again count the ribs to make sure you're going after All right. We're just talking about wings, so we've got to get our heads wrapped around cervical spine, which is what we're going to talk about next. So cervical spine, the idea is facet joint nerve block, facet joint nerve ablation, um, transforamal, interlaminar, a facet joint cortisone injection we're going to talk about, the AA joint, the C2 ganglion, and a stellate. There's a lot actually going on in the neck. Neck is a little more dangerous than the rest because we've got some arteries. And those arteries are going not only to the cord, they're also going to the brain. And we want to avoid those arteries, or at least we want to know when we have a needle in the artery. So, the best way for you guys to, to think about the neck is, you know, for, for a facet joint nerve block, we'll start with that. We generally want an AP view. I do, and Dr. Wu also does. In the AP view, and then we want a cephalocaudad uh, angle for the most part. And the reason we do is if we look at this, we look at that, there's something, in, and this is big, is magnified on the screen in a big way, but you can see something that's common on the lateral portion. It's this little. Um, indentation. We call that the waist. This is called the articular pillar. We call this the waist of the articular pillar. And that is where, you see right that little line, the medial branch of the dorsal primary amus lives, the facet joint nerve lives. So the concept for, for us is if we have this cephalocaudate angle, then we can see the joint, we can see the waist, the joint, waist, joint, waist very easily. And then the the doctor put the needle down to the bone, walk it around laterally where it's safe, next to the nerve, and then you see this red thing in there, that's a particular artery, we don't want to put it there. The idea is we want to put the needle tip right here, right here, right here, etc., all the way down. But if you have a little more cephalocaudate angle, you'll see that waist rather clearly. Sometimes you have to judge that orbital travel angle a little bit, and it may not be, some, in, in some it may be up down. In very rare patient, maybe even a little cardiocephalad, it just depends on that level. But if you're looking, you're looking for the waist of that articulate pillar, that little sulcus, that little indentation, that's what you want to project to the patient. You can see there's a lot going on in a small area. Down here, just a couple spots. This is the whole cervical spine in two lumbar vertebral bodies. 
So the idea is if here on this side, here on this side, some people will do a lateral projection, okay, for their uh, vestibular nerve block. I don't happen to like it because just anterior to it is the vertebral artery, the foramen, the cord, and if you're off a little bit, it's a big deal because you're in the stuff that really matters. So I always come down posteriorly because I, if I'm overbone, I know I'm never going to injure anything. That's the whole idea. Um, same thing with inflation. Once I walk down the bone, I walk it just lateral, and then we do our motor testing to make sure we're not too close to this spinal nerve that goes down and into the arm, for example. Uh, if we're too close to the spinal nerve, we'll cause paralysis or arm weakness, etc. Sometimes after the procedure, you, you know, a patient may say, well, I, I have some numbness in my arm. And I used to use Marcaine. That's 8 to 12 hours of numbing as uh, a nerve-wracking thing, because then you don't know whether you hurt the nerve or you just numb the nerve. So now it's just lidocaine now in an hour you're going to know the answer. But if they have a little weakness, our hope and pray, of course, and thank God over the thousands and tens of thousands that we've done, we've never had an injury. But if you're too far, what sits right here is this uh, segmental nerve that goes to the arm and have weakness, just like in the leg. That way. Or if you were to do it in the uh, thoracic, you'd injure the nerve coming underneath the rib. You could have all this pain wrapping around. You want to avoid that. That's why we do the motor test. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The other thing we do with the facet joint nerves is we ask the patient to turn to the contralateral side. And if they do that, not only do they move the jaw out of the projection of the ectoderm, now we can see things really well, it also turns and protects the vertebral artery from the needle because it turns it away. And it also makes it easier to see the waist of the articular pillar. So we'll have it turn to the opposite side. Good point, Jeff. Um, same thing when we do a transfer, I'll turn to the opposite side to protect that vertebral artery. Um, an inner laminar is almost always done at the base of the cervical spine and extremely rarely done above the base of the spine. There's got to be a really extraneous reason for me to do it at the, uh, up here. Uh, the reason being, it's just a lot more vessels in there. If I'm going to go uh, do a transfer on high, I'm going to use a, uh, a needle with a catheter from the inside out. Um, so inner lamer, same concept, base of the uh, cervical thoracic junction. A facet joint cortisone injection. Same concept, again, cephalocaudate angle, and if you look here at the joint, you see it's a shingled angle like that. Again, we want the needle to come in like this. You will never get in if you come top down. So you have the angle of the x-ray, again, cephalocaudate, so it's coming right up so you can see right into that joint, just like that. So that's the angle. Um, the AA joint, I'm actually going to leave that off. If the doctor wants you to do it, he'll show you how to do it. Um, C2 injection stimulates stellate. The stellate ganglion block is really somewhere around uh, C6, C7. It sits in the front part, so we place the patient in the what position? Supine, Supine position. We project uh, the uh, C arm so that they can, the doctor can see now the patient's turned over like this. And again, now we're trying to have a discal view, okay? So we're going to have a cephalocaudate. We're not worried about, we think about the neck always in a, um, you know, looking at the facets. This is the one time we're not thinking about facets. We want the discal view, so we want the disc to be um, uh, uh, en face, is what we call it. But the idea is to come down to the base of the cervical spine. You have the patient turn their head just slightly away. Then the doctor's going to put their fingers down, feel the carotid, push the trachea away in the esophagus. And then you're going to pace the face put the needle down between the trachea and the esophagus and the carotid. And then you put the, the needle really on the front part of the vertebral body a little laterally to a place called Chassignac's tubercle, which is this little thing right there. And then that's where you're going to do the injection. You should see the contrast kind of flow up and down. Yeah. It's, it's one of those very freaky procedures and <laughs> done, done incorrectly. You can really mess someone up, but it's if you know what you're doing, it's actually a very, very safe procedure. So, lastly, advanced concepts with the CRM, just a few uh, housekeeping terms. How do you deal with metal? So let's say you have a patient who's got a lot of metal uh, in their back. It's sometimes difficult. So let's say we're going to do a lumbar facet joint nerve block. Um, often, you know, what happens with the metal is the metal doesn't permit the x-ray to come through. So the, the CRM responds by pushing more energy and it over-penetrates the bones 
and of course you're not going to push it through the metal, so it just remains a black blob on the screen. The concept is if you use the collimation to move the metal out of the way, then you'll get an appropriate amount of uh, uh, exposure. So try to, to, to do that for the doctor. Additionally, with the hardware, sometimes, let's say with a facetional nerve block, you want a little lateral uh, oblique uh, view so that you can see around the head of the hardware. And there'll be a screw, like a pedicle screw, sitting, sticking right out here. And it's really hard to get here so from this projection. So you just give the, the, the doctor a little more oblique, and he can place the, the, the needle down around the hardware sitting here to the transverse process. Sometimes the process will be uh, uh, injured, or they'll try fusing all this, it will be messed up by the surgeon. But oftentimes you can actually still do the facet joint nerve block uh, just going, by, uh, going around the actual head of the hardware. When you store the CR, the way you want to store it is you want to bring everything in tight. You don't want the arm sitting out like that. You want it in tight, lock it in position. You want everything set in position and locked, and then you move it out everyone's way. You want everything just basically to be in a neutral position when you want to store it, then you turn it off. One last thing, what was it? Resetting. Occasionally, the C-arm will have a malfunction. There is an important button on the C-arm for you to know, and that is this red button here. Okay, it's on either side. Let's say, for some reason, it just starts taking pictures. You hear beep, beep, beep. Beep. It's just fluoroing. It's bathing everyone in radiation. That's your button to turn it off. Okay, you can also have that green light on the front of the scanner. Turn the thing off. Also, additionally, if the doctor may be standing on the pedal inadvertently and not knowing it, not paying attention, beep, 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 and the doctor is having a very important conversation, you interrupt the doctor. It doesn't freak matter. Okay, he is irradiating everyone irresponsibly and hurting everyone. You and the patient and himself. Interrupt him. Push him away. Turn this thing off, whatever it is. If he's doing it incorrectly, you don't want to hurt anybody. So that's also your responsibility to protect everybody. I think that wraps it up. Thank you guys for watching. This has been C-Arm Basics with uh, cervical, lumbar, thoracic, and other anatomy. How to do... Uh, certain procedures, how to operate the C-arm, and uh, accompanied by our staff, Michelle, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul, and Evelyn, and Taiwana, and then our excellent PAs, uh, Dominic and Jeff, who's, of course, uh, off arguing with an insurance company. Thank you for watching. <laughs>